Okay, thank you everybody for being here. I'd like to call this regular meeting of the Board of Trustees to order today, November 10th at 7.35 p.m. Could we please have the roll? Village President Torby. Here. Trustee Clark. Here. Trustee Collin. Here. Trustee Davis Ford is absent. Trustee Levinson. Quit. Present. Trustee Rosner. Here. Trustee Schnall. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Here. Mr. Lerner. Here. Mr. Rother. Here. Susan Calgene, present. Meeting notice statement, adequate notice of this meeting has been provided to the press in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, NJSA 10 colon 4-6. In addition, notice of this meeting was posted in Village Hall and on the Village website and has been filed in the office of the Village Clerk. Official action may be taken. Susan Calgeen, Village Clerk. Thank you. And now our first resolution to go into executive session. Resolution authorizing an executive session at the November 10, 2014 meeting of the Board of Trustees. Okay, the uh, matters to be discussed in executive session are the following. Uh, municipal judge appointments, which is a personnel and attorney-client privilege. Uh, affordable housing requirements, which is an attorney-client privilege. <coughs> the uh, development opportunity, which is attorney-client privilege and contract negotiations. Um, and fire department secession, which is a personnel matter. Do I have a motion? I move. Moved, moved by Trustee Collins, seconded by Trustee Levison. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. We'll be back at 8 o'clock.
Okay, thank you everybody for being here. I'd like to call this meeting back to order. Uh, could we please have the roll? Village President Torby. Here. Trustee Clark. Here. Trustee Collum. Here. Trustee Davis Ford. Here. Trustee Levison. Present. Trustee Rosner. Here. Trustee Schnall. Here. Mr. Lewis. Here. Mr. Lerner. Here. Mr. Rother. Here. Susan Kennedy. Present. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please stay standing for a moment of silence. Thank you. All right, a couple of announcements to, to get us started. Uh, the first is Saturday, November 29th, is Small Business Saturday. Um, as always, the South Orange Village Center Alliance um, and the Board of Trustees and everybody urges all residents, um, students, anybody who is in town to shop local. Um, as tempting as Amazon may be, we have a lot of great stores in South Orange for a little bit of uh, gift shopping. Um, and so the Village Center Alliance um, is hosting a contest um, this November 29th um, for Small Business Saturday. So all shoppers and diners who spend at least $25 from any business in the Village Center that day will be automatically entered to win $500 of, gift, of gift cards from local South Orange store services and restaurants. Um, so you just take your receipt um, and bring it to the Village Center Alliance table, which will be on Sloan Street on November 29th, um, and give your receipts to them for your chance to win the $500 grand prize for doing something amazing anyway, which is shopping in downtown South Orange. Um, what could be better? Um, if you have any questions about that or want a little bit more information, you can f find that out on the Village Center Alliance website uh, at sovillagecenter.org. Just another reminder, if any uh, folks are interested in volunteering, um, we are, as always, looking for volunteers. Um, and you can go to southorange.org and go to the Community and Volunteering section and find it there. If you have any questions, um, interested in any ways you could get involved, um, we still do have some openings, and there's always ways to um, get involved and volunteer on a more ad hoc kind of basis, too. Um, you can contact any of us um, and, uh, and let us know what you're interested in. We'll get you uh, uh, going in the right direction. Um, another reminder, too, anybody who's watching, if you do have a smartphone, um, please download SO Connect. Um, you can do so on your Android or your iPhone. Um, this is a service request through on one tool um, that allows anybody to submit um, a service request to the village directly. It gets routed to the right department. You get a case number. It allows us to more easily follow up if there is an issue. Um, so you can fill that out online at southorange.org slash 311, um, or you can download the app. Um, Leaf Collection has uh, started and will be going on through December 6th. Please leave your leaves um, at curbside. Try not to put them too much in the middle of the road. Um, and uh, they will be doing that again through uh, December. <clears throat> um, at the Piero Gallery, we are pleased to host Tableau, the latest exhibition at the Piero Gallery. Um, this show explores the changing meaning of the dinner table through photography, collage, painting, craft, and sculpture. Um, the show is open, and it's open through November 26th. Uh, the Piero Gallery is at the Baird Center at 5 Mead Street, and that's open Monday through Thursday from 11 to 4, and Saturday from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Um, registration has begun at the Bear Department for winter classes. Um, there's a whole lot of really great stuff available. If folks are interested in signing up or learning more about what classes are available, um, please go to thebaird.org. Um, I also want to make sure to uh, make two thanks. One is to the South Orange Historic Preservation Society. Um, at South Orange Middle School last weekend, they hosted a fantastic event, um, which was South Orange and its Colorful History. Um, and uh, it was a pretty amazing collection um, from different speakers, presenters, experts, uh, local historians about history in South Orange. Um, so I think they're making some of that information available online. Um, I know the uh, video um, that we did that showed some of the insides of Village Hall, which is pretty interesting, um, can be found on our YouTube page. Um, and um, I don't think is on our website, but will be today or tomorrow. Um, I also want to thank um, uh, Seton Hall University, um, all the students there, in particular Craig Whitmer, uh, the student government, the um, 
uh, and all the uh, Greek life organizations and administration and faculty. Um, on Saturday, we had a um, symposium that was aimed at taking some larger level kind of global policy challenges and talking about them um, on the local level. What can we do at Seton Hall uh, between Seton Hall and South Orange to work on some of these problems. We had workshops involving governance transparency, access to education, intentional integration, um, and a whole lot more. Yeah. It was a really good uh, set of workshops. Um, we had representation from the Board of Trustees. We had representation from the Board of Education, um, and a ton of students that came out as well. And I think everybody agrees we just had a fantastic um, set of conversations, and I know um, uh, that for those of us that were there, uh, we already left with some ideas on some different things that we can work on. So um, we'll be following up with that. And uh, I think one of the biggest takeaways was that we just had, uh, you know, a half dozen dozen structured, productive conversations between students and, and community members, um, and even among students. Um, and you know, as we work to try and bring South Orange and Seton Hall closer together, creating these environments where people can actually talk about their concerns and actually work on ideas together. Um, you know, I know for me, uh, seeing some of the stagnation at larger levels of government um, and people seemingly uninterested in getting involved, um, we have a lot of people interested in getting involved here in South Orange. Um, and it's really great to be able to bring the energy of Seton Hall more into that fold. Um, so the students organized the event. Um, and uh, put together the, the different workshops and the moderators and the agenda um, and just did a really fantastic job there. So I just want to make sure to thank all the students again um, for organizing that. And you'll be definitely seeing some of those different policy ideas that came from those conversations um, announced at various points um, up here as well. Um, so we have a couple of presentations tonight. The first one is going to be from HMR. We're going to talk about uh, the uh, programs and plans um, in regards to the Village Hall renovation. Yeah, and uh, just for introductory purposes, Eric Holterman, our architect from Holt Morgan Russell, HMR Architects, also in the audience is Mitch Fritz from J. Shapiro and Associates, our project manager. Um, Eric is here tonight to go through uh, the, the program. As you know, we're very close to finalizing the plans and going out to bid. So one of the final steps in the process is Eric wants to go through, give you an overview of the intended renovations of the exterior, as well as go through the program and the interior layout and which offices are where uh, to ensure that we're all on the same page and that we have the, the consensus of the board is, is the authorization essentially to finalize these plans and go out to bid. Uh, based on, on what we're going to go through tonight. So, thank you, Eric. Um, we've been working on this project for a few years. Uh, the program was studied very closely as we went through. We looked at several options and, um, uh, in the end, uh, arranged the program so that spaces are arranged for future flexibility, but uh, also respecting the historic nature of the building. Um, and uh, uh, some of the really important public spaces that you have. Uh, first, I have a couple of historic photos. That, just because this building is so important and such a great building, um, here you, this is so. This is looking at the uh, at Village Hall from the uphill side uh, before the fire department was built. So you can see the tower still has the. Uh, Belvedere on the top. Um, this is where the uh, future construction happened. You can see these trusses were actually built in a way that they projected from the side of the building. That was part of the roof construction. Um, and some of those trusses are still there today and part of the new design actually works around some of those, some of those trusses. Um, so uh, early 1900s, uh, after the addition was added on, you can just see a little bit of the addition in the back, but um, uh, you know, early 1900s, things are still horse-drawn. You can see the uh, uh, front uh, porch, uh, all three openings. That was an open porch there where the clerk's office was. Um, Belvedere is still in place. Um, it's a, that's a, that's a, a really uh, high resolution, good, good quality photograph. Um, so here we are in 1905. The fire department has moved in, so we have fire department there and there, and also fire department there as well. Um, you can see a difference in the diamond pane glass in some of the old windows, and then the addition had a different diamond pane pattern. Uh, that's being um, uh, precisely restored uh, with new glass in, in exactly the dimensions that, uh, that were there originally. Um, another view, same angle, uh, with three, three fire department bays. 
Um, here you can see a plaque, a war plaque at the front, and we've, uh, uh, um, the plaque was long, removed long, long ago, uh, but there, uh, the, there's a brick pattern that, that frames that plaque, and we will use that as a, uh, a spot for signage for South Orange Village Hall. Um, early 20s, there, there were actually some significant changes in the 1920s uh, at South Orange Village Hall. Originally, the meeting room was larger, the um, staircase to the second floor was originally uh, at the front of the building at this corner where Ellen's office uh, is. And then uh, when the changes happened in the 1920s, they actually made the meeting room a little bit smaller, brought the back wall forward in order to include some more spaces behind it, um, and moved the staircase to its current location. Um, we're not planning to move things back there because the building, um, the meeting room works at the size that it is. Uh, and also we need the office space. So we're keeping the stair uh, exactly where it is so that much of the second floor remains in a similar configuration. Um, here you can see the changes at the, uh, uh, at the, at the uh, clerk's office at the porch where that's been enclosed. Um, and I think you can see the war, the war plaque there. But you can also see that the uh, um, roof has been redone and the uh, Belvedere has been removed. Um, that copper work on the roof is still generally in good condition, so we're not looking at, at restoring the Belvedere uh, because it's already in good condition. There's no reason to, to make a change and spend money there. Is the clock in uh, I think the clock is not here yet in this, in this one, right. 1920s. Um, these are our uh, exterior restoration drawings, um, just to give you an idea of what the, what the construction drawings look like, so that along with these drawings is a uh, long list of keys. Everything here is keyed with uh, uh, letter notes uh, telling the contractor what the work is that he's doing, divided by different category, uh, carpentry, stucco, brick masonry, copper, roofing, um, things like that. Um, and all of, all of the elevations of the of the building are are uh, indicated this way. Carefully, we've been we've been over the entire building. That's the uh, uh, elevation in the alley, and then the South Orange uh, elevation, and the uh, what is currently the building department wing, which will be the tax department wing. Uh, floor plans, the uh, green areas are the public areas, uh, generally circulation, sometimes public bathrooms, things like that. And the gray areas are various offices. So uh, a, a couple of the big changes that we made early on in this plan were to recognize this side entrance as the, as the de facto uh, main entrance to the building that gets a lot of traffic. At the same time, we are reopening the main entrance, restoring it. Um, it you know, it has a it has a grand public scale, uh, and once it's reopened, we also think that there will be much more uh, pedestrian traffic through this through this um, entryway from from the rest of South Orange. However, day-to-day uh, -day activity, most people who come by a car come in this door. So we really wanted to clean up the circulation, and that's the main thing that has happened here. We're, we're losing the little arch. Um, however, we are keeping the stairway going up, and in order to open things up a little bit, we're moving the, the, sta the basement staircase, which is back here now, and we're tucking that in underneath the um, second floor stair um, so that we have a larger open space here. The uh, clerk's windows uh, originally wrapped around the corner like this. Um, currently, they, only a few of them were left open, and then there was a temporary partition built across. So we're really reopening this, making it more of a, of a larger open public lobby in the middle, also with those um, clerk office uh, transaction windows wrapping around the corner, so there are five of them. And then directly opposite from that will be the historic staircase. In general, uh, where there is significant historic fabric, we're restoring that, and that is is pretty much limited in this building to uh, the, this this corner of the clerk's office, the staircase, and the meeting room upstairs, which really gave us pretty free reign on uh, renovating the rest of the building as simple, straightforward, um, modern, workable office space. So in this corner, then the clerk stays in this corner. There's the vault. 
um, administration back in this corner, uh, a, an employee workroom right here, uh, mail and uh, uh, copying Xerox machines, and a, a break room back here, finance, um, uh, uh, tax assessor back here. Um, uh, this the, the name the name of this group changed. Barry, can you remind me Bill what this? Center Alliance. Thank you. Right. <laughs> and uh, and then the uh, the wing. Then this is all given over to tax. The uh, public lobby area then is is in this area for tax with a with a transaction window here at the very end. This is a mechanical room for the geothermal system. The geothermal, pipe, geothermal system is in wells out in the parking lot. Uh, will be paved over. You won't be able to see it at all. It will be completely covered and completely invisible. But those pipes come up in the end of this, what used to be a, a, a practice uh, rifle range. And then those pipes come up here and then, and then run across here to get, to get into the rest of the building. And, uh, on this one point, and the, the, because it's split in that green area, where you see in the upper right, EN, that's an entry vestibule on the other screen where now people will be able to go in directly into there and get straight to the tax lobby. And as you know, that's one of our most frequent foot traffic. Um, so it's, it's, what Barry's talking about then is, you know, this little ramp right here then. We're actually, right now, the wall of the building is this line back here. We're actually building a new wall in front of that here so that this space, which is now outdoors, would become enclosed. And then uh, from the other plan that I just showed you at the tax office, then that lobby connects through indoor space. And then this hallway, which is a much shorter route, you know, right now you have to sort of go around like, you know, like this to, to get around. Um, so a much shorter route to really shorten the circulation and make it much more efficient uh, comes right around like that. So this one rectangle here is the one piece of actual new construction on the whole building um, that's a, a, a new, new enclosed heated and air conditioned space. At the second floor, the meeting room is essentially restored. Um, originally, we thought we would be able to keep some of the wood paneling, some of the other wood there, but the um, uh, abatement process meant that uh, most of that had to come down. So in fact, you know, we have new finishes here. Um, however, we are keeping the, uh, the railing and the dais, uh, the dais table. We'll, we'll see what happens with that. For the moment, we're keeping it. Um, but, the, but the existing rail will be stained to match the other woodwork uh, in the room. Um, in order to comply with uh, fire egress requirements, there is a new vestibule built in the back corner of the meeting room um, so that we can have a door that swings out in the, in the direction of egress and at the same time separates the meeting room from uh, the stair, and that's a, that's a, a fire code requirement. Um, one other change on this floor is that this space back here, which was a trustee's room, uh, will be a fire egress space so that it, it can't be used as a trustee's, as a dedicated trustee's room, because this room needs two good means of egress to the street from this space. So the trustee's room is instead moved back here to where the parking, parking was. It's actually a better room. It's better located. It has better windows. And it's a better location for the trustee's room. Um, one of the other changes that as you come up the stair, when you arrive at this landing, there will be another small staircase that continues straight ahead so that when you arrive at the top of the staircase, you can either go turn right to go into the meeting room or you can turn left to get to the elevator or to IT. This is all IT. Or you can continue a few steps farther straight ahead. Um, and then there are some uh, public toilets up there, another elevator landing, and the lobby for the uh, construction and engineers' offices. Um, engineering is back here. Building department is is all over over here. Uh, I think that covers the floor plans. The elevator is located. Uh, right now, the elevator is located here. This is really the only place to locate the elevator in the whole building because it needs to serve uh, the first floor and it needs to serve the lower level on, on this side of the meeting room and it needs to serve the second floor. So that elevator in the middle, which is a, a code requirement, um, it, it really does need to be central and pretty much everything else needs to be laid out around that elevator. Um, these are a few drawings of the uh, dais, uh, I'm sorry, of the meeting room. Um, so 
uh, this is the door that goes to the uh, small spiral, s small staircase off to the side. That stair will no longer be, no longer have an exit sign on it. It won't be a fire exit anymore. It'll just be for uh, internal circulation. Um, Wayne's coat will all be restored all around uh, dais and then a new screen, a new drop down screen from the ceiling um, so, that, so that it would be easier to uh, make presentations. Um, this is looking towards the back of the meeting room where this door then is the door to the trustee's office, or trustee's room. Um, this is a wood paneled vestibule, which is the way in and out of the room from the hallway. And then this window is a window into the uh, stair staircase, which lets some, some borrowed light go through. This other window is to the uh, projection room. And then there's a solid panel in the middle. Um, Looking the other way, these are the three dormers. Uh, new lighting throughout in the meeting room. That's one of the things that, that although the room's being changed, the colors will all be changing. I don't think anyone's too sorry about that. Um, and uh, all the lighting will be changed as well with uh, period reproduction lighting. Um, and again, the, the dais here with a uh, ramp built into it because it's also a code requirement that the dais be uh, ADA accessible. And then, and then this drawing is looking, sitting in the audience, looking at the dais. Um, in the process of the abatement, much wood had to be removed through the whole building, but in fact, all of this wood we were, we were able to retain. So, so there, the, the dais will look very, very familiar. There really isn't any change to the dais, apart from the addition of a ramp at the back right corner. Um, and that's the explanation of the building. I'm, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Yes. I have, I have two questions. Um, First of all, I, I like the design and I like the way you've maximized uh, the usage of the space. Mm -hmm. It's a very peculiar space, so I like that. One thing that seems to be missing uh, dramatically is conference room space. So we tend to have a lot of committee meetings, mm -hmm. both internally and, and with residents, and I didn't see that. And um, uh, mostly you didn't see it because I, I failed to point it out. Ah. Uh, on the first okay. floor, uh, here is a conference room on the first floor, and then at the second floor, Uh, we have the trustees room. So there are two good, two good conference rooms in addition to the meeting room. We, we actually found that we needed three, and I thought we had agreed that there was going to be a third conference room or one room that could be a flex space. And I thought originally we said that the uh, room off the dais, the fire egress room. This, I this thought we room, were gonna, right. I, I thought I'm we were going to put. I, that a meeting room. I, um, you know, but we can put chairs. We can put chairs in there, though. There, oh, yes, there can be chairs. So that could be an open meeting room only. Yes, okay. Can. Okay, and, and then my other question is, um, are, you, are there any plans for the basement, uh, either for storage or, or for usage at all? It's a, it's a large space. I don't know if we're trying to... Uh, um, the new HVAC equipment uh, takes up a lot of that space because there are a lot of smaller units. It's part of the geothermal system. Um, so there, there, there are, I, I don't remember the exact number, but, you know, seven or eight or nine uh, units in each unit is kind of this big uh, in the basement. Um, also, there's a dedicated IT room. Um, that, you know, in the past, there are, there's also another storage room. Uh, in the past, that space has been used for storage. It's not very well suited for storage right. because it's been very damp. Uh, the new HVAC system will, sh will take care of most of that uh, so that the space will be drier, but we still don't really recommend using it as storage. Um, but that space is mostly dedicated for IT, wiring, infrastructure, and uh, uh, mechanical systems. Okay. Alan? No. Are there other questions? Was there the addition of giving the public access to the conference room? It was something we discussed previously. Is that even when none of us are around, if, if advisory committees or groups needed access, they would have a punch code and could be able to access it from the outdoors? Is that something that's in here? The, um, yeah, let me go. Uh, back to the first floor plan and in fact the, the the plan has been intentionally laid out so that in the evening these doors can be open and all of the office spaces can be locked off okay so that uh, when there's a second floor meeting uh, the meeting room can be open um, and people can still use these bathrooms for instance or you know uh, use this circulation hall but they wouldn't be able to get into any of the offices um, so it was laid out that way intentionally that the that the lobby can be un left unlocked. Um, I mean, you might still need you know some some security or monitoring or something like that, but it can be left unlocked um, 
and unmanned, uh, and people would be able to come in and use either this conference room or spaces upstairs. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to check on one thing. When uh, the Public Works Committee had reviewed these uh, plans, uh, there were a couple of things we were concerned with. Uh, I was particularly concerned with the, uh, there was a great deal of two by two fluorescent lighting, uh, especially on, on the second floor. And I was hoping that that could be changed uh, relatively easily to LED lighting of the same. Um, it's, it, it actually, it, you know, the, the plans that originally showed two by two fluorescent lighting were, we've been working on this project long enough that, you know, fluorescent lighting was really the standard lighting at the time and LEDs were initially thought to be too expensive. Um, in that time, the cost of LEDs has come down considerably, and now we have changed all of those two-by-two two fixtures to two-by-two two LEDs. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one other thing, bike parking. Some of us um, might want to show uh, up. There's <laughs> a, you know, we, we haven't shown, we haven't brought the landscape plan along, but there, there is a landscape plan that um, uh, doesn't change any of the grades, but cleans up some of the walkways and some of the, uh, uh, you know, once the, once the, um, uh, uh, chiller is gone, you know, you gain, regain that right. space outdoors as well. So there is a new planting plan, um, and there's bike parking uh, set for this corner right here. So that, you know, there's a walkway that comes in this way to that side door, and then there's sort of a, a plaza here, similar to what's, what's there now, um, and then another walkway coming around this way, and we've, we've called for some bike, uh, bike parking hardware right in this spot, right above those steps to the basement. Thank you. Do you know off the top of your head the usable space back when our offices were in the building versus what type of usable space we have now that it's reconfigured? We, we have all those numbers, but, I, I, but I, don't, I, don't, I don't have them in my head and I didn't bring them with me. Okay. Uh, so I, we, can get that, we can get those numbers for you, though. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? <coughs> Great. All right. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Really Thanks. appreciate it. Um, so before we move on to a presentation uh, from the Community Coalition on Race, I know we have um, Mr. Frank Delgadio from Essex County here, um, who would just like a couple minutes of our time. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, Thank Ernie. Thanks. He's got some sort of surprise in his hand there. S <laughs> curves completed. That's our big check that we missed. Uh, Frank Delgadio, I'm the uh, the municipal liaison to South Orange from Essex County. Um, a few weeks ago, we had a press conference um, it was during the day, and I don't know if anyone was able to attend the, the conference, but this was the uh, local aid program check to the village for $150,000. I'm sure you've already received the money, but this is just the, <laughs> the uh, symbolic check, so I'd like to make this presentation tonight to the, to the village. I'm sure it's going to uh, produce. <laughs> Um, also, as you know, the, the South Orange Avenue construction is ongoing and there were some road closures for the first time and hopefully that'll be, it'll be, that will be it. Um, it's replaced the actual, the footbridge that goes over with a historic looking bridge that uh, is being put in place. So um, I know it was disrupted for a few days there, but uh, uh, that work's been completed. So. Um, Moving forward, there should be no further disruptions to the traffic flow there. So. Is the uh, project uh, on uh, on time in terms of uh, deadlines and stuff? Of course. <laughs> 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 the county executive makes sure of that he's Fires. the best construction manager out there. So um, at every meeting, doesn't miss a meeting, and always the contractors are always advised of uh, you know on budget, on time. So yeah, absolutely. And, and on a related note, well, first, just feel free to come by any time if you're going to bring us $150,000 <laughs> checks. We really appreciate that. Um, and second is um, I, I just want to make note that, you know, we had a couple issues with um, uh, PSC and G and the way they were filling or not filling in, mostly not filling in, um, with some of the potholes that were created on South Orange Ave as they were looking for gas leaks um, and things of that nature. And I just want to make a note to thank, uh, to thank Essex County. Um, the county executive and others were uh, really helpful um, in setting up a couple meetings and making sure that the concerns that we had got passed along. And I know some of the work had been patched, um, and I think they're, as they're working, they're, you know, issues do keep arising. Um, but it is nice to know that the um, county is there and available 
um, in, in, in kind of you know being an advocate for us on, on issues like that. So just wanted to make sure to thank you guys publicly for that help. Yeah. Thank you, and always available. You know, I'm easy, I could easily be contact. Anyone has any issues you need to be resolved, by all means, the easiest way to reach me is email. It's 24-7. So um, anything I could do to help out, I'm here for you. And the county exec always has his ear open and, um, and responds very quickly to anything that comes up. So. Moving forward, that's the way uh, we'll continue to, to service with the liaison program. Uh, it seems to be a very useful program. So, Just wanted to add a little bit more appreciation. We had our Senior Citizens Town Hall Forum in South Orange a couple of weeks ago, and the Essex County Division of Senior Services was there. And the gentleman, I don't remember his name off the top of my head, did a really great job talking about the county services mm -hmm. that our seniors can take advantage of. He came prepared with bags full of information, materials, Swag. And um, we really appreciated uh, the county having a presence here for that. Yeah, thank you. And if I could just do um, a little explanation, the $150,000 check that uh, you, I, I, you on the board, I know will recall that last year the uh, freeholders were generous enough to open up the Essex County Open Space Historic Preservation Recreation Trust Fund to municipal applications. Um, administratively, Mr. Lerner, myself, uh, we were able to make an application. What we identified was a historic preservation project, the Connect Building and the roof, which is sorely in need of repair. Uh, worked very closely with our library director, Melissa Kapecki, so um, big shout out to her. Uh, we're successful, and, and that's what the $150,000 is, and that'll go a long way towards uh, preserving that building. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, welcome up uh, representatives from the Community Coalition on Race. Um, they have a, a brief um, presentation for us. Good evening. My name is Leila Gonzalez Sullivan, and I'm one of the vice chairs for the Community Coalition on Race. Uh, we're here tonight to share with you a resolution that the coalition passed recently and which we've also presented to uh, the township of uh, the town of Maplewood. I'm going to read the resolution and then I'd like our executive director, Nancy Gagne, to uh, provide some details and we'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, our resolution reads, be it resolved that the South Orange Maplewood Community Coalition on Race, that the events which occurred, helps not to use the glasses, <laughs> the events which occurred in Ferguson, Missouri, have been deeply troubling to all people of goodwill in this country. The South Orange Maplewood Community Coalition on Race finds these events to be particularly disturbing because they represent precisely the type of racial injustice that we find to be enormously offensive and which we have fought so hard to counter since the time of our inception. Because Maplewood and South Orange are communities which aspire to be places where the events in Ferguson would never occur, the coalition requests that the South Orange Board of Trustees and the Maplewood Township Committee adopt resolutions which condemn the killing of an unarmed black male teenager and the militaristic overreaction of the Ferguson police force uh, to the public protest in violation of the Constitution's First Amendment guarantees. So I just want to, hi, I'm Nancy Gagne. Um, I'm struggling with the glasses too. Uh, some background on the thinking uh, that went into the uh, resolution. We talked a lot about this at the uh, trustee level at a number of board meetings. And the trustees have considered specific responses to uh, incidents in other communities across the nation that involved uh, individual or community practices like racial profiling. We certainly talked about the Trayvon Martin case, Jordan Davis, Oscar Grant, just to name a few of the tragedies that we faced as a nation. Um, and these uh, incidents have given rise to national responses to profiling and things like explicit bias, implicit bias, and broad systemic forms of racism. And the conversations that we've had as a board um, about these incidents have produced ideas for forums and community conversations that are relevant to our needs here in South Orange and Maplewood. 
In fact, our recent conversations on race last spring, we focused on uh, the issue of implicit bias, and that's one example of, of how we've tried to be proactive. Uh, so some, some of the trustees and some people in the community have asked why the specific response to um, the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson. The more we learned about Ferguson and the more we thought about it, um, we saw that the fact is that Ferguson is a racially diverse but not integrated community, a community with leadership that is not racially representative, that has what some have called intentionally segregated schools by virtue of how the boundaries are drawn, and a community whose economy uh, is oftentimes dependent on fines that, are, uh, that burden the black population um, unfairly. Uh, so th there are things to compare and big differences to be drawn uh, between the two communities. But we are a community that knows firsthand that those situations are potential perils of a diverse community unless there are uh, race conscious strategies. Uh, in place to counteract those segregative uh, forces. So what happened to Michael Brown and what happened within that community afterwards really hit home for us. And we know that racial instability is the pattern for communities that experience demographic change as Ferguson did and as we know our community did just 25 years ago, uh, unless there are pro-integrative strategies in place. Most communities, we can see lots of examples across the country, are reactive rather, th rather than proactive on race issues. Uh, and in the case of Ferguson, it was really brought into uh, painfully greater relief. Um, and those strategies, by the way, include things like integrated schools with policies and practices that ensure equity for all students, fair housing ordinance, ordinances, fair lending practices, neighborhood associations, representative leadership in government and civic organizations, activities that support an integration culture uh, that allow people to build relationships across racial and cultural divides, honest conversations about race, and uh, staffing that is inclusive and, and diverse in uh, community organizations. Um, so this is the kind of work that we do, and uh, you know we just want to speak to the issue of Ferguson. I uh, attended a panel on the root causes, well, that's what they purported to address, uh, of Ferguson that included uh, the Democratic Township Committee woman, Patricia Bynes. She's an African-American woman who serves uh, in a mostly white local government. And at this panel, she placed special emphasis on the problems of the lack of representative leadership, the economic incentives of police to give fines, and the need to address uh, systemic racism in the community. And I'm gonna quote her here, this is what she said that morning. We're going to get the conversation about racism out there. The business community needs to address it. The politicians need to address it. We all need to address it. Uh, we think we're doing that here, and we want to just keep you on board with that. Um, the last thing I want to add is that next week, um, we are hosting a Two Towns, One Book event with uh, Professor David Trout. It will be at the Woodland in Maplewood. Uh, that's Tuesday, November 19th at 7.30. Uh, you don't have to have read the book to come and learn quite a bit. It's a great book. It's called The uh, Price of Paradise. Uh, he's some, someone, some of you may know, he's a professor at Rutgers. Um, the book really speaks uh, directly to communities like ours and the question of access and opportunity in uh, metropolitan centers, urban centers, and their surrounding suburbs. I think he has a lot to say to us uh, in Maplewood in South Orange. He lives in Montclair, he knows us well. So I hope you'll come out and hear what he has to say, and then you'll have an opportunity to talk with uh, other residents. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do folks want to have uh, a conversation now uh, while they're here to be able to answer some questions, or do you want to add it for later in the meeting and discuss? Do you have a preference one way or the other? Either one. Um, OK. Um, well, I can, I can start, because I, I have an ask at the end of my comments. Um, and these were some comments that were expressed um, over email to the Community Coalition on Race when we got this as well. Um, and you know, my reaction, although I appreciate the, uh, the effort at addressing what's a very serious problem, um, I was very disappointed in this resolution. Um, on one hand, um, some of the background is helpful as far as understanding why this particular incident 
um, was kind of picked out to be used. But on the other hand, there are quite a number of other incidents, not only like this, but just in general, um, that seem worthwhile talking about as well. And one of the things that I feel like I notice more and more these days is um, people reacting to tragedies in a way where we tend to focus very much on the story of one particular tragedy and we forget to um, really reconcile with some of the, the, the more root causes that you, that you did mention um, just, just a moment ago. Um, and so that, you know, that the, the specificity of this one incident was something that um, struck me as uh, problematic. Um, in addition to that, uh, you know, there were other issues um, around this incident um, that should probably be addressed as well that are related to this issue, having to do with um, surplus military equipment, you know, being made available in a way that our tax dollars are funding um, and that probably most folks who pay taxes would not particularly be um, supportive of. Um, and that there's an entire system in place to encourage the trickle down of you know, military equipment for non-military situations. Um, and that there were also other law enforcement agencies outside of just the Ferguson Police Department, which is the only law enforcement agency named in the resolution, um, that were both problematic and in very, a very small dose at one particular temporary point, um, seemingly helpful. Um, but that uh, the specificity of only looking at one law enforcement agency, to me, um, was also problematic. Um, as well as the, you know, if we're going to uh, take a stand on an issue uh, like this, um, you know, it, the resolution doesn't really do a service to uh, the Community Coalition on Race, and it doesn't really do a service to this community um, because it's a very sort of generic reaction um, to something. It doesn't really address that, you know, this is an issue that we have grappled with in this community um, for decades and done you know, what I think we would all agree is a, you know, an incredibly um, almost revolutionary job at, at being better than most. Um, and so I would hate to uh, undermine all the effort and energy that's been put in over the past couple decades of people working on this um, by making a very broad and general kind of statement. Um, you know, it's very easy, I think, to condemn a tragedy. Um, I think it's a, you know, it's a little bit harder to figure out what to do. Um, and so I know for me personally, I would appreciate and would have appreciated the opportunity for us to be more involved with um, working with you in figuring out how best to, we can respond either as a governing body, um, as a village government, as a community, just as citizens. Um, and to me, this resolution doesn't, it doesn't do enough. Um, and in not doing enough, it seems to me to do a disservice to the issue um, because it, it, it's not unreasonable, I think, to have to react to that issue in the way that this resolution sort of proposes, um, but it's also not complete. And uh, I'd like that if we were to formally um, engage with this issue and make a statement about it, that we do so in a way that is more complete, that understands the unique history of this community, our unique efforts in this community as a village and as a police department, um, to build trust between our police department and our citizens um, and to create uh, community policing programs that I think we found to be very effective. Um, and so all of that being said, uh, you know, my, my ask would be that we do something, um, that we do something better than this, that we do something more complete than this, um, that we do something that takes into account uh, some of the different issues that I've, um, that I've just brought up and maybe any of the other concerns and any other um, governing body members have and sit down and, you know, if we're going to do it, you know, do something, do something that brings it all together, um, that, that, uh, that meets those issues and talks about what we're going to do as not just a community here in South Orange, but as two communities, um, what we're going to do um, so that something like that, A, doesn't happen in, in these communities, um, and B, that we can do whatever we can to make sure it doesn't happen elsewhere. Um, and I think the only way that we can make any significant, um, uh, any significant mark in doing that would be to address the issue a little bit more deliberatively and uh, comprehensively, which I, which I know I would personally be happy to do, and I would think that um, anybody sitting up here would be happy to spend as much time as needed to be able to do as well. If I can just quickly um, respond. We, we wanted to use this resolution, and, and there were differences of opinion among our board members as well, 
how to phrase this sort of thing, why were we doing it right now and about this particular incident rather than the others. But I, I really do agree with you that this is an, an opportunity for the two towns and the coalition uh, as, as one of your organizations to, to do something more. And so our hope was that by presenting the resolution, it would be a kind of a trigger for us then to look more deeply and, and to come up with a broader, or not maybe not broader since this was very broad, but, but with a more um, a clearer response and a, and a clearer uh, statement of intention, if you will, that, that all of us in the two towns and, and in the coalition can really get on board with and work, uh, you know, work towards something that, that really makes, makes it clear that we want to be different and, and that's our firm intention. Uh, if, I could, if I could chime in, um, I want to thank you both for coming out tonight and for presenting this. Um, I, I guess I'm in agreement with Alex in that I see the, the resolution is a largely symbolic act, but I also think um, we are very fortunate in the fact that we have a community coalition on race to which we can turn to to begin a discussion of more substantive uh, recipes, if we can speak in such terms, uh, for, for success in this area. I think, un un unfortunately, there are many, many events which you could point to and have a very similar resolution, uh, uh, far too many. Um, and while I, I, don't, I don't think any community is immune in any way, I do feel thankful in that our community, frankly, has some inoculation against these things, uh, one of which is the existence of the Community Coalition on Race, uh, something which does not exist in a number of other uh, uh, communities. And uh, additionally, I, I would just want to make a shout out to our police department because I know they've been doing some community outreach efforts and uh, uh, that um, I wouldn't want this to be seen as any kind of uh, a preemptive uh, knock against our police department. Um, uh, we have been fortunate that we haven't had issues like that. Um, but again, uh, I think the fact that these two um, both the, the police in their community outreach and the community coalition on race and the work that you do, do provide us with some inoculation. And I would also like to be involved in working together with you to try to come up with some prescriptives that we can do that are tailored particularly to our community uh, going forward. I'd like to say I'd like to be at that table. I want to thank our village president for articulating so clearly that we need to look at a holistic approach and at the same time recognize some of the great work that the two communities have done. Um, um, as uh, we often state, there are many communities that claim to be diverse, meaning that they have one ethnic group and another, but they're segregated. This is one of the few communities that I know that every um, economic demographic that exists here is fully integrated in its work. Um, um, and uh, the most um, important, it's so easy to ignore the elephant in the room and what your organization allows for us to do is to have that discussion because people avoid it, they're uncomfortable with it, um, and when you avoid it and un uncomfortable with um, the important discussions that need to be had to air issues or to come up with solutions don't happen and that creates an environment for misunderstanding and, and misreading uh, people's uh, positions, intentions or um, actions. So I want to commend you for um, uh, bringing this to uh, start a conversation but I, I, I agree with my, my colleague here and the president that it's not good enough and uh, I want to be at that table. Well, I want to thank you and uh, just to end, end by saying, unless there are other questions, that I, we think there is power in the symbolic gesture as long as there's something backing it up and we do believe that the Community Coalition, along with some other uh, efforts and, uh, in the two towns, are, are the things that stand behind uh, the statement and the work that we do, and but we're we're very open to more uh, activities, programming, and conversations that uh, speak to the issues uh, that 
uh, are in the resolution. Just a quick question. Has Maplewood, I know you made a presentation to the Maplewood Township Committee. Have they reintroduced a resolution? I know they had, I think, tabled it or they were going to draft something similar. They wanted to draft their own words. And, and I, sh I probably should have said at the outset that um, Fred Perfetta, who's been our chair but is, is inactive at the moment, um, uh, he really put the resolution together and, and was a bit of the driving force behind it. Um, uh, he really saw this as uh, the opportunity to begin a conversation and as suggested wording, um, but not necessarily the resolution that you should pass, but that you should be as your own deliberative body, have your own conversation. And that's exactly what Maplewood seems to be doing. They were receptive to the idea, thanked us, and, and said that they would be talking more about it. And that was it. I'd also suggest that um, in crafting whatever resolution that the uh, group lands on, that we do it together with South Orange and Maplewood, a joint resolution. Um, and I do echo what Walter, Deborah, and Alex said. And just one additional concern that I've had um, as chair of the Public Safety Committee. Um, you know, I watch on the news and I see on Facebook and Twitter this almost growing anti-police sentiment yeah. where people are cropping videos, um, you know, showing police brutality. And um, I think we need to come up with a way to address that also because I'm very proud of our police department. Mm -hmm. I, I see the relationship every day, how they interact with our community, um, great community relations officer, um, their response to all the people who live in both South Orange and then Maplewood, mm -hmm. um, and, and a way to tie this resolution into the overall policing that we have in these two towns where I think we really have dedicated officers yes. who understand our commitment to diversity, integration, yes. uh, treating people with respect. Um, so if the, if the CCR can also try and figure out a way that we can do that better and involve our departments, because mm -hmm. I know how important the relationship, especially with youth yes. um, and our police department is, I would really, really appreciate that. All right, we'll, we'll bring that. We have certainly had that conversation at the trustee level and we'll have it again. I'll, we'll take I'll that say, back. You know, the first thing I said to Alex, I think, via an email was, you know, we have to keep it local, these kind of resolutions. And, you know, and to Sheena's point, you know, we, we, have, we have a police force that's worked very hard to build a community. And if you look back a few years ago, and I guess it's four or five years ago, when we had some trouble with teenagers in the downtown, most of whom were black, the police handled very well in a nonviolent way. And, and despite the, actually, despite some objections to some people that we didn't go far enough in, in arresting, but we actually brought it under control in a very peaceful way. And, you know, part of like the downtown after uh, sundown concerts to help you know, bring the people back to town and it worked very successfully. And I think those are positives. I'd rather see that in the resolution than a negative about some other town. Right. And in fact, I wouldn't mention the other town at all. I would just say, we're, you know, we're anti-police brutality or something. I just don't think it's necessary to single out one town because mm -hmm. it really takes away from the overall resolution, in my opinion. Thank you. So, it's, I mean, it seems like, you know, I, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that I, I can speak for everyone here that, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, we look toward, that we look to from the Community Coalition on Race is guidance here. Um, and though we appreciate um, this being brought to our attention as far as starting the conversation, um, you know, just sort of from an almost, um, you know, process perspective, I know that uh, you guys spent a fair amount of time discussing this resolution um, before it got to the point where it was. Um, and I think in the future, you know, we're more open you know, we're completely open to, to being as integrated of a partner in talking about these things as possible, um, especially something like this where, um, like some other, like some trustees have said, um, you know, it seems like it might make the most sense to do something joint between South Orange and Maplewood. Um, you know, I don't think you're going to have anyone, you know, sitting here who wouldn't be happy to volunteer to, to talk about, um, you know, how we do that, um, how we highlight the, you know, incredible job, you know, that we've tried to do, you know, with our police department, and, and the commitment of all the individual officers for, for doing that, all the incredible work that the Community Coalition on Race has done in the past, um, and all the different community groups that have worked on this. So, um, you know, my, uh, it, it sounds like sort of the takeaway here is that um, uh, I think would be fair to say is that you guys can, uh, should let us know how you want us to be involved in this process, and we're all willing to do that. Um, but we're certainly interested in your guidance um, and your leadership in, in doing this. Um, and we'll, we'll be right there with you. Um, but if you can help coordinate that effort between both the towns um, and create a conversation where we feel like we can all, you know, put some ideas down at the table and, you know, get something that, that our communities will, 
not only be um, supportive of, um, but will actually make a difference. And will actually set an example, which is I think the best thing that we can do, um, is tell our story, um, of our, our South Orange and Maplewood story, um, to other places and let, let people know that you know, it can be done the right way. Yeah. Um, so, so I think we'll look to you to provide us with those next steps. Um, and I know I certainly appreciate, and I think everybody appreciates, um, all of the work that, that you guys have done um, and um, the intention and interest and desire in expressing these thoughts in a productive way um, that brought you here today. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we will take it back to our trustees for further com uh, conversation and come back to you. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, at this time, I'd like to open the meeting up for public comments. Um, so if there's anybody who wishes to speak, I don't know if we have the book or not. Um, but if not, if you'd like to just come up to the microphone, there's one right here at the middle of the stage. Um, and just state your name and address and keep your comments. Um, please try and keep them to three minutes, please. Uh, sure. Yeah, there's a mic right. Yeah. Thank you for hanging with us today. It was a long wait to <laughs> get to public. <laughs> Uh, we can hear you. Can you can just yeah, yeah, it up. Yeah, I know if they like loosen that. It'll we'll lower it back for. Don't start my clock yet. Okay. So good evening. My name is Brittany Timberlake, and I stand before you today um, first as a community activist and a uh, public advocate, but also as your freeholder elect. And I wanted to come and talk to you about earned sick days. Earned sick days is something that has uh, been a very popular topic throughout New Jersey. Um, there are six other cities that have passed earned sick days, and we wanted to give an opportunity to tell you about what it is and to also give you an opportunity to possibly form an ordinance and adopt it here in South Orange. Um, I attended Seton Hall University. And one of the issues on campus was when one person got sick, everyone got sick. And sometimes it could have been from a food service worker or something along those lines. Earned sick days, uh, first of all, let me say that there's mechanisms that are put into place to where no one can really take advantage of it. There's a certain amount of uh, days that are added after a person works a certain amount of time, and it goes up to a certain amount of days per year, which don't tend to roll over. And my colleagues will further explain that. Um, but had there had been an opportunity for some of the food service workers who generally are, are low to moderate income to have called out, some of the you know, sickness may not have spread about so easily. Uh, earned sick days, it strengthens the economy. Over one million New Jersey workers lack paid sick days. And nearly one quarter of adults in the U.S. have been fired or threatened with job loss for taking time off to recover from illness or for taking care of a sick loved one. I mean, how many of us have had to, to take off because we were sick or because our child or, or our family member needed to be cared for? Well, there are people who, who don't have that luxury and uh, who lose their job when their child gets sick and they have to take off. Um, and also, as you all know, uh, some parents, for that very reason, send their children to the daycare or to the school sick, which then what happens? Gets your child sick. <laughs> and it's a constant um, revolving cycle. Uh, locations that have implemented paid sick days are doing extremely well. Connecticut actually was the first statewide paid sick day law. And the Department of Labor reports that since the passage of paid sick days in 2011, mind you, employment has grown in Connecticut, in, Connecticut, in leisure and hospitality, and education and human service sectors. Earned sick days strengthen families. Parents with paid sick days are 20% less likely, 20%, to send their child to school sick. When their parents are able to care for them at home, sick children get better sooner. This is a fact. And reduce the risk of spreading the illness, as I stated before. One in four parents of a child with asthma have missed their child's medical appointments because they don't have time off. So I know my time is up. 
this is something for low to moderate income people. Low to moderate income people need it more. Oftentimes, people who have high paying salary jobs have this as a luxury. Why not everyone? South Orange has great businesses here, lots of food industries here, and I think it makes sense to do it. So I'm going to introduce to you uh, Marcia Marley, who's going to tell you a little more about it. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank South Orange Council for a hearing yeah. about earned sick days. You've got to speak into the mic. Push it down. How's that? Is that better? Yes. yes. Thank you. Here we go. All right. And to, tonight, I want to go over the, briefly the benefits and also the impact on businesses from cities that have already passed it. First of all, and this is the most important thing about earn sick days is it's a public health issue and it should be passed on that alone all right there's the center for disease control found that more than 10 million cases of foodborne illnesses are caused by sick restaurant workers contaminating food while at work and 79 percent of food industry workers do not have paid sick days. Do you really want that sick worker sneezing on your burger or your fries or your special sauce? <laughs> <laughs> paid sick days also reduce work-related injuries, according to the Institute for Occupational Health and Safety. Access to earned sick days also reduces use of hospital emergency departments by 14%, according to the research. The health cost savings from reducing the spread of diseases and less emergency visits has been estimated at over $1 billion. Another benefit that's already been mentioned by Brittany is that it strengthens families and helps parents. Uh, parents do, ha do not have to choose whether to send their sick child to school or lose their job. They should not have to make that decision. None of us should have to. Finally, it is a question of justice and a level playing field. Uh, some business groups have claimed that this will cause them to actually move out of town, close down their business, reduce workers, increase unemployment. They won't be able to afford it. However, not only have these fears not materialized, there is evidence that the product productivity of workers actually increases when you enact this law. Based on real life experiences, non-data, not speculation, the research shows that the cost to businesses of this legislation are minimal, right? And the benefits for employees, employers, and the public are substantial. Locations that have implemented paid sick days are doing well, and the law is now supported by an overwhelming majority of all the cities or states' businesses that have passed the ordinance. That has been the case in the state of Connecticut, cities of San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Seattle, um, and now our own Jersey City. Employers have not moved to other towns. Unemployment has not risen in these towns or, or states. And in, F in San Francisco, the lobbyist for the Golden Gate Restaurant Association, who was initially against it, called it the best public policy for the least amount of cost. Thank you. All right. Am I over now? Yeah. OK. Thank you. Uh, can I say one more thing? Sure. It's, um, there's been a concern that they will abuse this. In fact, in research studies after research study, they've only used half of the allowed days. That's one reason that this is not a major cost. All right, so if they have five days, which this ordinance does, they use like 2.5 on average. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, ready? Uh, my name is Craig Garcia. I'm from uh, New Jersey uh, Working Families. I'm the campaign coordinator for Earn Sick Days. Um, I just wanted to give a couple of the nuts and bolts about this ordinance and, and how it's functioned in other municipalities. Um, it's now been passed in uh, eight towns across the state, including Jersey City, Newark, Patterson, Passaic, Irvington, East Orange, right over here, 
and um, just in the past couple of days uh, in Montclair and Trenton, uh, Trenton we got 85% of the vote there, in Montclair we got 75% of the vote, so it was really wonderful. Um, that goes to show this is not only a, a really wonderful social policy that can take place on the municipal level, um, that can go against uh, inaction at uh, higher levels of government, including the federal and state level, um, but it's also a very popular initiative. Um, essentially how it functions is we like to call it earn sick days. Why do we call it earn sick days? Because for every 30 hours someone works, they get one hour towards a bank of sick days, and they would have the ability to accrue up to five sick days per year. Um, and that is for specifically for businesses with 10 or more employees, they get those five sick days or 40 hours a year. Um, for businesses with nine or less, it's three sick days. The exception of that, to that being uh, for public health, workers that work directly with the public, um, including uh, food service workers and uh, childcare, they would also get the maximum of five sick days. And why? That's because, it, again, it's a public health issue. Someone shouldn't have to come uh, to work sick. They shouldn't have to make the decision between um, putting food on their table and um, f feeding their family, paying the rent, and um, going to work sick, right? Uh, this also, a couple little more nuts and bolts about the, the ordinance. Um, we use uh, a definition of family that includes uh, grandparents, uh, parents, and children. That means if your kid uh, is sick, you can take that day off of work instead of sending them into school and potentially getting everyone else in the classroom sick, right? Um, so that, that's why it's such an important public health policy. And it, right now, as it stands, there's a perverse economic incentive to show up to work sick because you need to make that money. And like uh, Brittany mentioned, people so often have to make that decision between putting food on the table and, you know, providing for their family. So this is a great economic policy. It's something that could be done here at the local level. Um, it's a great way to bring the community together and also focus uh, on helping out low-wage workers that would m absolutely most benefit for them. So um, I can also answer any questions about the ordinance. I did uh, bring some basic uh, points about the ordinance and a copy of the ordinance as it's been passed in other municipalities. One thing I would say is if uh, the council is interested in pursuing this policy, that they follow along how other uh, uh, municipalities have passed it so as not to create an overly burdensome patchwork of regulation. So, okay. Thank you. And if you'd like to bring that information up, our Absolutely. clerk can take that. Um, is there anybody else who wishes to speak at this time? Well, well, just as a side note. Well, no, um, he, has to, he has to close. Um, so if there's nobody else who wishes to speak, um, I'll close. Uh, would you like to? Okay. Alex. You got to talk into the mic. Yes. <clears throat> Good evening. Mayor Alice P. Torpy, Councilwoman, Councilmen. This p past weekend, parking in South Orange was horrendous. I have a solution to the parking problem. Pro problem. Build a five store parking lot in the firehouse. Build it at, at the same bricks, bricks, as you. Build it as the same bricks and color, color. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Okay, thank you. Um, so close. Sorry, if you're going to speak, you just have to use a microphone. Yeah, if you just, sorry, just keep it really quick. I just wanted to say that this was, um, this is also an issue of equality, as I said before, you know, like low to moderate income people, which I include myself in that, and even if the Lord should bless me to not be low to moderate income, I will still represent that, always. Um, and if people who have money have the luxury to be able to have paid sick days, then doesn't it make sense for people who struggle every single month and are living paycheck to paycheck to have that same luxury. And that was just the last thing that I wanted to say. And I wanted to thank that, uh, Deborah Davis Ford for letting, me, letting us know 
about uh, the opportunity to come and speak today and to present this to you. And I hope that we'll be back perhaps in a formal presentation to answer more questions in detail and then hopefully to show you the ordinance and have you all voted in. Sure, thank, thank you. you. Um, Alex, if we have questions, could we ask them? Yes, although uh, what I was going to offer and suggest was that, I mean, this sounds like a perfect issue and it sounded like this had maybe been discussed in legal and personnel. It was just, um, it was just introduced and I distribute uh, samples of uh, resolutions and some supporting documentation, but we didn't have an, I wanted to give uh, the committee uh, an opportunity to digest it so that at our next meeting we could have a more robust discussion and come up with a recommendation um, to the board as a whole. Sure. So if there's a couple of quick questions we could do it, but I, I'd prefer to try and keep most of the conversation in the legal and personnel committee where we definitely, I think this is an issue that we definitely want to work on. Will you um, be that's able a, to That's attend? a better format. We can invite you more, to come to our committee meeting. Yes, that's right. And that's a, that's a better format for a more interactive conversation at that committee. And yeah, no, that would no. be great if we could have a representative there because there's a, there's several questions. And you don't have three minutes. You have yeah. more, as long as... You know, yeah, the, the comment that I was going to make is that we've opened this up, this discussion at our legal and personnel committee, uh, and there are a bunch of, a number of caveats that go along with it that we would appreciate y uh, you guys coming back and maybe can answer some of those questions. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, two weeks from tonight, November 24th at 6.15. Thank you, Mary. Sure. That was my question. I knew it was. <laughs> and, it's, it, and it's at 76 South Orange Avenue. Uh, the PNC the Bank building are. in our offices. No, oh, no, it's here, right? Oh, legal and personnel. Yeah, that's right. Here. We have it be here. in the I'm same sorry. building, but upstairs. Okay, so November 24th here at SOPAC. 615. Upstairs. 6 upstairs. You come upstairs. in this way. And yes, it would be great if you guys were able to be there and we could have a, you know, a little longer conversation about it. And uh, I know folks have some questions, so yes. we definitely appreciate you bringing it up to our to. attention. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and also to follow up on the, the comments about parking issues, um, I don't think we can build a parking deck in the firehouse, um, but we certainly are incorporating expanded parking. Um, and Alyssa, I know this is a conversation we had in Starbucks the other evening, um, but we are, you know, every redevelopment project that we're looking at, you know, we're interested in finding a way to increase the amount of parking that we have. <coughs> um, I think it's fair to say that, you know, and third. that we, right, that we all recognize that, um, you know, parking is definitely a problem, some of which is going to be mitigated just when, um, commuters are able to park back at 3rd and Valley, that's going to make a huge difference right away. Um, and not even thinking about the 50 or 60 spaces, additional spaces that that will make available. Um, so 3rd and Valley is obviously going to make a big difference there. Um, other projects that we're looking at are also all, <clears throat> all contemplate adding as many parking spaces as we can possibly get so it's still financially feasible for the developer to actually build there. But, you know, we all understand it's a problem and I think um, you know, in an ideal world that we have a couple different parking decks, you know, a little bit on the periphery of the town that creates a more pedestrian flow on the inside. Um, so the concern, the concern is definitely loud and clear, um, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about it. Um, but it's part of all of our plans for redevelopment. Um, we're, we're, you know, we're doing everything we can to increase the amount of parking in town. So we obviously all know it's a problem. W would I be correct just to restate what you just said? that uh, we wouldn't even entertain any uh, development downtown unless it, it, it included parking. I think it's fair to say, I mean, I would try and avoid speaking in absolute terms, okay. but I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that, I mean, um, I can't imagine new, us right. doing a project like that right. without some addition of parking. Okay. Um, so, uh, moving on, um, uh, we have, uh, I believe, one ordinance on for a second reading tonight. A second reading and public hearing of an ordinance amending placing portions of chapter 122 recycling article one of the village code thank you um seeing as this is the second reading of this ordinance i'd like to open uh the meeting up for public hearing if anybody has comments on this ordinance specifically <laughs> seeing as there are no members of the public who wish to comment on this ordinance um unless there are any further questions or comments from the board i would ask for a motion i, I move, move. Se I second. Okay. Moved by Trustee Collum, seconded by Trustee Davis Ford. Could we have the roll, please? <coughs> Trustee Levison? Yes. Trustee Rosner? Yes. Trustee Schnall? Yes. yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Collum? Yes. Trustee Davis Ford? Yes. Thank you. Um, just one I'd, I'd like, and, and Trustee Levison pointed this out earlier today, the, the listing that was in the ordinance, although taken straight from the, um, the version provided by the county, we think can be 
reordered right. and, and a couple of clarifications with no substantive changes. It'd just be an editing of the order of the lists and some of the phrases that they use. So uh, if that could be done uh, prior to it being finally enacted, yeah, I think I, I would sent Barry a make for an easier read. That just showed how to the, uh, the components line up better in the order. For some reason, when they did the three different categories, they have them in different orders, like papers at the bottom of one at the top, and it would just be much cleaner. It won't be a substantive change, but just so everybody's on board with that. And it uses the terms that are in the definition. Right. That's fine. Okay. Barry, just could you get that to me? I will. Okay. Um, now we can move on to our consent agenda. Okay. Resolutions 296 through 304 are on the consent agenda. Are there any questions or comments on any consent agenda items? Okay, do I have a motion? I move. Moved by Trustee Collum. Second. Seconded by Trustee Rosner. Could we have the roll, please? Trustee Rosner? Yes. Trustee Schnall? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Collum? Yes. Trustee Davis Ford? Yes. Trustee Levinson? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> it really is a lot faster. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so now we're going to move on to our trustee reports. I want to make a note. Um, that we, uh, one of the things that we discussed in our um, goal setting meeting for 2015 was um, reorganizing these meetings a little bit and uh, what, I, what we all thought would perhaps be the best way to do the trustee reports is there's going to be a couple changes um, coming forward. One um, is in name, um, these will no longer be committee reports but they will be trustee reports. So instead of each committee giving a report, each trustee is giving a report, which is actually um, an important difference because each trustee does much, much more than serve on the one committee that they chair. Um, and uh, as Trustee Column so eloquently notes in her bullet points, there are multiple different committees almost at every meeting um, that do require an update for the members of the public. Um, so instead of, instead of pretending like they're giving their committee report, <laughs> um, uh, we think it would be better for each trustee to have oh, the opportunity okay. to give a report to the public. Those will involve items from the committee that they chair. Those would involve items from any committees they may be a liaison on. Um, and they can involve any items in general at all that the trustee feels um, is appropriate oh, to report on at the meeting. Okay. Um, the next piece of it is that because the, uh, if folks notice when we do our conference agendas, there's at least two or three committees, um, if not more, each meeting that don't have a report to do because of the meeting schedules. Um, so what we're going to do is sync up the three committees to each meeting so that in every single board meeting um, there will be uh, th uh, three committees that will give their report. Um, three trustees. Three, three, three yes, trustees report. that will give their report um, out of the six standing committees. I like that, that. Um, and so by That's doing better. that, um, there aren't big gaps if someone just misses a Board of Trustee meeting because their committee is meeting the next day, but the next meeting is a regular meeting, so it's going for the next conference agenda, which would be, you know, three weeks and six days from then. Um, so this should do a couple things. One, it gives the trustees more of an opportunity to present some of the things that they're working on, which might be outside of a committee, which is important. Two, is it makes sure that there are not large gaps in the reporting of the things that are happening in the committees um, or by the trustees. Um, and three is it just makes the meeting make a little bit more sense. Um, so and what all the trustees, is what's that? And it's not as one meeting is not so long. That's right, right. Shorter. And so it's spread out a little bit over yeah. both the meetings as well. So we're going to be doing the reports, um, all the reports, uh, that piece of the conference agenda at every meeting. Um, so we'll have kind of the regular meeting in the beginning um, and the conference agenda portion at the end. Um, and so we hope that makes a difference. And all the trustees uh, completely 100% on their life promised that they would get their bullet points in before the before their board meeting for which their report is due. <laughs> Obviously not looking at you, Trustee Collin. Um, <laughs> right. and, um, and so those bullet points <laughs> okay. will be gotten, I will do. be given in ahead of time um, so that members of the public who are looking at the agenda do, do see that these three trustees will be reporting and uh, they'll be generally reporting on these topics. Of course, that doesn't limit them. Um, to talk about anything else, but it does provide members of the public a little bit more information about um, what people will be talking about. So, with that being said, um, Trustee Clark. All right. I, um, I get to go ahead of Sheena tonight. That's, of course, you caught me on a thin night. Uh, as far as the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee, the last meeting we did address uh, uh, some resident concerns uh, regarding roadways and uh, some safety issues. 
Uh, however, uh, the majority of that meeting was taken up discussing Village Hall renovation plans and, and reviewing those documents, which, uh, you know, we kind of went over already. So uh, not much directly from Public Works uh, there on that one. Uh, I will say, though, that the uh, River Greenway Committee, we did have our uh, last Seton Hall University service on Saturday's day where we were able to put uh, uh, about 50 or 60 uh, Seton Hall students to work uh, weeding and planting bulbs along the Rawway River. Um, and uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Kirk Barrett and to Janine Bauer for running those. Um, and of course, a shout out to Seton Hall University for uh, uh, allowing us to put your students to work. Um, so that's going to be my report for tonight. Okay, thank you, Trustee Clark. Trustee Collum. Okay, so under Public Safety Committee, we had our Community Leaders Emergency Preparedness Meeting. Um, this was held on November 5th at the Baird. We had roughly 50 attendees, and I want to give a thank you to our Deputy Village Administrator, Adam Lerner, and also our CERT uh, Chairperson, Andrew Boyarski. Um, basically, the overview of the program was I had reached out to different community organizations, leaders, neighborhood associations, um, churches, synagogues, to try and assemble a team that can help us with emergency preparedness for the next big storm. Um, really incredible showing of people who represented so many different groups. Um, and we just basically gave an overview of the CERT program itself that has training sessions associated with it and then also went on to what the auxiliary members of this group would do, um, which means they're not going through the training, but they want to volunteer in some uh, form of a state of emergency. Uh, the results of this meeting were pretty impressive. We got 17 new full CERT members who will go through the training in January, 17 auxiliary members, and then one of the other things that we were pushing was um, doing group presentations on emergency preparedness for households, neighborhood associations, all of that, um, and that was 17 also. So there were 17, 17, and 17. Um, an announcement is that in January, during four Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., starting on January 10th, 17th, 24th, and 31st are going to be the trainings that will occur at our Baird Community Center. So for those interested in actually going through the full training, um, please contact our CERT chairperson, Andrew Boyarski, at southorangecert at gmail.com. Any questions on that one? I just want to insert a... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Settle down, trust me. I like that one. God, I've never seen you so full of fire. And the microphone vigor. was not ready. <laughs> we have a pretty impressive showing, though, just on yeah, our board of yeah. trustees. As we have Walter, who's been a CERT uh, volunteer for a while. I did the CERT training about two years ago. Deborah's been through the training. Obviously, Alex and Trustee Schnall began the process of going through the CERT training. So all we need is. Mark and Howard, <laughs> and we will have a board fully uh, cert certified. Um, next is the traffic calming policy. Uh, I am expecting an introduction of an ordinance, uh, actually not an ordinance, but a policy at the December 8th meeting, which will give us one more time to bring it back to public safety and our South Orange Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, there's two parts to this. Originally, I had shared that we were looking at a policy uh, similar to Maplewood that provides us with a matrix and criteria to evaluate um, once we receive data from our traffic bureau. Um, but along those lines, I also wanted to create a guidance document for neighborhood education on uh, specifically DOT guidelines and pros and cons of various strategies uh, for traffic calming. I think uh, very frequently re we receive emails from residents who say, you know, if you could just put speed bumps here or um, I, I think this intersection needs a stop sign. Um, I think I've repeated this conversation so many times with people that it's not as simple as the municipality just putting uh, stop signs up or throwing down speed humps. Um, I think, for example, stop signs can't be used to um, be a hindrance to speeding. They, they are meant to um, display to people the right of way of um, folks at an intersection. So there's all these little things that I think residents, if there was a quick FAQ on what all these items are, um, it would be helpful for them to understand exactly how these uh, different traffic calming items could be implemented and what the benefits and possible downsides of some of these items would be. Um, also, we have existing requests. Once, hopefully, we can get something passed, 
uh, we have a series of concerns from residents that have been brought up over the past year um, and some going past a year. Uh, we have Mayhew and Harding, uh, which is a continuation for quite some time. Um, and I think I've covered that at board meetings. We also have Montrose Avenue between Scotland and Ridgewood, Walton Road, which is by Farrellfield Park, Cameron Road, which is in Tuxedo Park, Riggs Place, which is adjacent to uh, Seton Hall University, Irvington Avenue at the Seton Place Crosswalk, and then we also have Montague and Village Colonials. So there's, there's a lot of roads right now where um, there are genuine requests from residents that feel that there's a real problem there. And obviously the first step is gonna to be to go to the police department, have them do enforcement, and also provide us data on what's really happening on those roads. Um, but I do hope that uh, once we pass a policy and we have the data in place, we can start preparing for both our operating budget, if we're gonna authorize any studies, and also the capital budget um, in anticipation of any potential uh, infrastructure improvements that will need to achieve some of these things. Pedestrian safety update. Since mid-April, uh, the police department has issued a total of over 800 summonses associated with the Cops and Crosswalks campaign. As you may recall, that grant expired a few months ago, um, but the board of trustees authorized continuing these details because we felt they were important. The breakdown of this is 385 failure to stop for pedestrian summonses and 438 other traffic violations. Those would entail speeding or texting uh, while driving or talking on one's cell phone. So obviously a big thanks to the police department for their continued enforcement efforts as it relates to pedestrian safety. Page two. <laughs> <laughs> we are also, this is for the legal committee, uh, one of the concerns that was brought to us by Trustee Clark uh, with respect to our hedges ordinance, uh, we'd like to look at section 138-10 in the code, um, and this is regarding vegetation and intersections. Um, and what the police department and the public safety committee is looking for is a little bit more flexibility in how we address site distance issues as it, re as it relates to vegetation at intersections. We've had a couple instances where there have been significant problems, accidents, but our existing ordinance didn't allow the police department to actually um, enforce um, or, or it didn't have anything to enforce. Our ordinance didn't actually address it, so something was consistent with our ordinance but still caused a public safety, public hazard. Um, so we wanted to um, pursue whatever flexibility there might be to give the police department more authority yeah. to go after that. At, at uh, Trustee Levinson's suggestion, I have already started to look at that ordinance and, and have some greater flexibility in terms of who could take action. Uh, because it appears from uh, what, what Trustee Levinson has said that there is some issue there. So we've already started looking at that, and I'll have Two that parts for to you. that. There's yeah. the yeah, there, allowing more people to enforce, to enforce it, and then there's giving flexibility that even if the intersection is consistent with our ordinance, regardless of who enforces it, that if it's a public safety hazard, if there's a site distance issue, that the police department ultimately can have some level of authority. Sure. I don't know and, how and we I, tweak that language. Right, I, I can certainly work with uh, council and it largely relates to intersections that are not, you know, totally perpendicular lines. Right. And where you have angled streets, then when you do the measuring out, sometimes it doesn't exactly. cover the situation. Yeah. So it'd be to provide a sort of a catch-all after the fact where within the, you know, judgment of the traffic safety officer or something that they can also enforce. Can we have something, Steve, prepared for legal and personnel a draft? Great. Sure. And if uh, you want to follow up with me, I can give you the particulars on what we're shooting for. Emergency upgrades. Um, if you recall, several months ago, the Board of Trustees and Planning and Zoning Committee discussed whether or not there was flexibility from COA to utilize monies within our affordable housing trust funds for emergency upgrades to affordable units. Both COA Council and our village planner joined us on a conference call to discuss this opportunity and uh, felt that they felt that ultimately we would be able to expend these funds from affordable our affordable housing trust funds without having to actually make amendments to our spending plan, um, but we are still waiting to hear back unless they have sent anything. Mr. Lewis, have they given any indication if COA has responded yet? I haven't heard anything back okay, yet. Okay, so still 2BD, um, and uh, 
And, and this was a result of a request that we received from somebody who operates some of the affordable housing units that we have in the town. So ultimately, if, um, if COA comes back and says that we can make those changes, I think it was the board's consent that we would move forward with allowing that appropriation for emergency upgrades. Uh, first night announcements, wristbands are now available for purchase in person at the following locations for $15 in South Orange, Kitchen a la Mode, Spark House in our library in Maplewood, uh, the Maplewood Library King's Supermarket, and they can also be purchased online at firstnightmwso.org. Prices are going to go up, so get them while they're hot. Ongoing projects. Um, I wasn't able to attend the meeting last Friday with the project manager working on our CAD RMS implementation, so Trustee Levison, if I miss anything, feel free to um, fill in the gaps during your report. Uh, basically, two items that we successfully did the switch over to REMS replacing Union County Dispatch for Medical Dispatch, and um, that was done last Tuesday and also received the proposal for the camera security system from Kratos, and there's a final meeting, I believe, this Thursday, um, and this is going to be consolidating all the various camera security systems into one. Um, I do not have an update on the radio communications, but hopefully we will have something before us at the next meeting regarding Phase 4. Um, and then uh, we authorized a contract at our last meeting with the Goldstein Group to do the headquarters assessment uh, phase one. And from my understanding, they've now had two programming meetings thus far. Is that correct, Mr. Lewis? Yeah. And uh, that covers the Public Safety Committee report. On to Senior Citizens Advisory Committee. We had the Senior Citizen Town Hall meeting on October 26. We had 100 attendees, 11 exhibitors, and a special thank you to the Board of Trustees and the staff, um, of which there were so many in attendance, and I thought that went a really long way in showing seniors that we, as a board, are really committed to addressing some of their concerns in this upcoming year. Videos from the forum are posted online. So for those of you who couldn't attend the forum, you visit southorange.org, go to the Government tab on the left, down to Videos, miscellaneous meetings from our YouTube channel and there are two videos posted there um, the senior citizens committee will be meeting on the 18th to discuss the comments um, that were put forth at this forum and ultimately do a write-up of recommendations to the governing body on what some next steps will be um, even prior to that meeting though we had a s kind of a working group meet with the parking authority to focus on senior citizen transportation if you recall when I did the stops at the senior homes transportation was one of their really big issues and uh, special thanks to Mark Hartwick the parking authority and those who participated senior housing senior housing yes yeah. um, for coming up with new bus routes that kind of uh, focused on what the seniors said that they would like to see. So just as an overview, what we're looking at is Monday is special trips to Maplewood, um, Springfield, uh, that's where the Best Buy is, Whole Foods, et cetera, uh, mall trip during the Mondays, and also the fourth being regular day service. Tuesday is a regular day service. Wednesday is Essex Green trips, regular afternoon service. Thursday would be regular daily service, and so would Friday. Um, and so hopefully they'll be announcing this. I think it was their goal that they set at the forum that by December they would like to go live with the new schedule. And it was also suggested from the committee that um, once this has been finalized to also um, use one of the pages in the gaslight so that seniors know how to take advantage of this service. Um, and lastly, uh, this relates to the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee, myself and Trustee Schnall. Uh, attended a meeting with the Stillman School of Business a couple days ago, maybe about a week ago now, and uh, they have a club that is called Enactus. Enactus is an international organization found on college campuses around the world. College teams work throughout the year to develop a portfolio of projects with a strong social empowerment aspect. The idea is that teams use their entrepreneur skills to create business plans of action for how best to improve the social welfare of a community anywhere in the world. 
Um, a bunch of folks from South Orange attended to throw out ideas, and I'm happy to announce that one of the projects that they are going to be taking on is senior citizens and technology. And that was one of the issues that was brought up from the Senior Citizens Forum. I know it's one of the concerns that's been raised by people on the Public Information and Marketing Committee, and so I'm really looking forward to the students working with our library, um, our senior you know, services, and also some of the senior homes here on uh, creating Creating a program that shows seniors how to use technology better and hopefully takes advantage of some of the tools we as a village have put out such as public stuff or the uh, peak democracy message board uh, and I, I think that could be very exciting I'm getting there I'm about halfway through we have our business code review task force our next stakeholder forum scheduled for November 17th Shh. November 17th at 7 p.m. at Rickleton's. As a reminder, the first forum that was held um, with stakeholder groups was at SOPAC. It was attended by roughly 40 people. We are announcing tomorrow a customer service and code review survey. Um, and so if you see business owners, please encourage them to take advantage of it. Uh, this is a big item, so if you've already tuned out from my report, come back. So, and this has a budget impact too. One of the things that we're talking about in code review, it's been brought up with Savka, it's been brought up with our Irvington Avenue committee, is that a lot of the surveys that we've put out to the community um, with respect to our business districts, often uh, the responses are, why do things look so bad? Can you make some improvements to the awnings? Can you put a coat of paint up? I think it's mainly just the look and the feel of, of some of the storefronts within our business corridors. Uh, so we've been looking at some matching grants programs that would be available for all the business districts. If you recall, Main Street used to uh, operate a fronts program, and this is a little bit similar. Uh, the way that it works, and this is just a broad overview, is that the work that gets done needs to be visible from the street. You can't do things in the back that aren't visible to pedestrians. Examples of the type of work that would be eligible for a matching grant include exterior painting and masonry repairs, repair or replacement of windows and doors, exterior lighting, um, which is also a public safety benefit, ADA upgrades, which we heard from our Senior Citizens Forum, uh, canopy or awning installation or repair, design installation or repair of exterior signage and um, removal of any type of barriers uh, for access to the building from the outside for people with disabilities. So those are just some examples. Obviously there's plenty of examples of things that you can't do anything on the interior, HVAC, you know, buying a new couch, those things aren't eligible. Um, and then essentially the way that the program would work is that we would have something similar to a design review board uh, so that we have somebody regulating what type of things that we want to see. I mean, we have some great volunteers, a part of Sofka, who have worked with new businesses and getting good uh, designs uh, up and running in, in our business districts. And then we've seen what poor design can, can do. Um, and you would need approval through the DRV. This is a reimbursement program also, so we don't just give money out in advance. Uh, so the cost of the program, and this is something for the board to consider, is that really it's at the jurisdiction of whatever we decide is appropriate. So if what I think is a, a reasonable match is up to 2,500, so if you think about that, if the board of trustees put $50,000 aside, I'm just using that as a rough estimate, um, you could, with a maximum $2,500 match, that's 20 projects. I think that's probably pretty aggressive. I don't know if we'd be able to complete 20 projects, but even if you cut that in half, if we we set aside $25,000 for a matching grant pro, uh, program, we could do 10 projects in the year. So um, something that we can discuss more during the budget workshops, but I think um, between the business code review team and also both of the uh, business districts that have advisory committees or active nonprofits, this is something that uh, I think we all see as adding a, a good incentive and would be great overall value for the look and feel of all three business corridors. Any comments or questions on that? That's 50000 in the budget, Mr. Lewis. Irvington Avenue Corridor <laughs> Advisory Committee. No, I'm just kidding. Holiday event. So they're looking at something for Friday, December 12th, uh, planning as a part of a holiday weekend in conjunction with Sofka. Sofka has their uh, big event on Saturday, a tree lighting, some other activities, and what the Irvington Avenue Events Committee is looking at doing something Friday night that's a little bit more scaled to the neighborhood um, with music, winter festival, something like that, and a partnership with Seton Hall. So save the date, something 
something will be happening that night. Uh, branding launch, as you may recall, the board authorized a contract with ITO for a brand identity for Irvington Avenue. The marketing committee is getting ready for an unveiling of the new district name and identity um, with details coming shortly. I think that they have been doing a really fantastic job and I look forward uh, to their presentation to the board and the community on the direction of what that brand is going to be for Irvington Avenue. Reminder. There's a website for Irvington Avenue, irvingtonavenue.weebly.com. And there is a Facebook page, facebook.com backslash South Orange Irvington Avenue. And it's up to 315 likes, likely thanks to the Food Truck Festival. And lastly, and it wasn't a bullet point, but I'm adding it. I'm already on page four anymore. The redevelopment and rehabilitation studies. At the last planning board meeting, Susan had indicated, Susan, our village planner, indicated that she will have reports ready within the next month. This relates to providing uh, substantial evidence, which she's still collecting uh, before she makes a recommendation and presents to the planning board. Um, the planning board also, and I'm sure Mark will cover this, recommended to the Board of Trustees accepting the study from our planner for townwide rehabilitation. And lastly, we have received a memo from Redevelopment Council's Office on Next Steps in this process. Um, this is regarding the townwide rehabilitation where they outline kind of the different steps that we need to take um, and what the recommendations, and I'm sure Trustee Rosner could, could speak to this a little bit more, but the recommendations um, from planning and zoning for townwide rehab would be that all the business districts get the full extent of uh, the potential exemption slash abatement for improvements and that we're also uh, pursuing some options for single family homes to also be eligible. That's the end of page four, thanks. No more Is there meetings. a beginning of page five? Or? I actually scaled back a little bit. <laughs> no, thank you for the thorough updates. Um, Trustee Davis Ford. Okay. Uh, at our last meeting, um, we, t we spoke about the status of recodification. <coughs> this has been a long, ongoing process. Um, um, just to recap, it's a process of, of really, really looking at the whole South Orange Code. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a code is, it's really like the, the laws of, 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 of how the municipality should be run. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask our um, council uh, just to uh, weigh in at this point as to where we are in the process. Well, we're looking to have a sit down with general code to uh, wrap up uh, the loose ends at, at this point, uh, except for a couple of specific sections that still need some some addressing. And, and what particular areas are we struggling with at this particular point? Well, there, uh, Trustee Levinson has pointed out uh, s several that are uh, out of sync with current practice, uh, one of them being uh, alarms. Okay. And that was something that we spent a little time on and um, and since this is your baby, your issue with the alarms, um, uh, what are you looking to do with uh, regards to changing the alarms in town? One of the things you pointed, pointed out is that most of the calls made by the police are because of alarms going off and there's really no issue. Well, one of the highest uh, calls for service are response to false alarms. And um, our, our alarm code currently is obsolete because it, it was written in a time when people attached their alarms by um, telephone line to the police station directly. Uh, that no longer exists at the police station. Uh, and uh, currently the process really is a third party uh, uh, answering service that responds to a uh, alarm that occurs either fire or uh, burglar alarm. And so what was being proposed was to uh, create a, a structure where we would have permitted uh, installation of, someone would have to obtain a permit for in installation of, a, of an alarm that would need be registered uh, within the village. And I think I passed around uh, a number of municipalities that have done it, and even Montclair has a third party who provides that service for them. Um, the other is that um, we can now, uh, when I report on the CAT RMS, we're capable of recording uh, these uh, false alarm situations when we have to send somebody out. And we can now track the number of times false alarms occur to a particular residence. And uh, we can 
issue a, uh, a violation or a summons uh, for uh, numbers of false alarms that the police have to respond to. Um, that is all part of the construct uh, of one eliminating a section which no longer applies and the other one is, is to enhance it so that we get better reporting. One of the things I would be interested in, and you may have had this uh, data, or maybe Trustee Collin, is of the calls that are made uh, on an annual basis, what percentage of, the, uh, of those police calls? It was in the report. Uh, do you have the number? Do you yeah, there remember? was a total of 1,500. It was uh, one of the highest calls for yeah. service. Yeah, and so can you imagine if this was uh, addressed when, so that that's reduced it, um, the uh, efforts of the police could be addressed in other areas that would be more beneficial to, to the, the village and a better return on investment of their salaries and time. So, uh, you know, something like this that takes up so much of their police time is, but, but is, that was poor is alarming, the, yeah, no was, pun intended. Yeah. Nice one. <laughs> that, that was part of uh, our code <laughs> review initiative and when looking at um, what we're doing in the recodification is that uh, what the recommendation was is to, to look at each one of our ordinances one by one to see if they still apply. A number of them just don't apply anymore. Um, the, the other major one is the fee schedule ordinance, uh, which is in, a co in our uh, audit comments that we should have a. Uh, yes, that's that's true. Well, one of the things that we we, we shouldn't lose lose sight of. We've gone through the, the code now to take out those matters that by law we can't have in the, in the code because there have been a number, uh, a number of cases that have been decided by the Supreme Court that would now make certain provisions that were in the code unconstitutional. We've, we've, we've found all of those. We've rooted them out of the code. We also have restructured the code. The code is, it does not, is not going to follow the same format. There's a, a more modern format that general code has provided to us. Uh, and we can go on and on digging through the code and finding all these other sections. We don't have to do that. We can, we can move with this code and, and you know, I'm, I'm asking my associate who's handling that to end that, to, to, to bring general code to the table, get it resolved because as we find other of these sections that we want to change, we can change them and it'll be reflected in the code. So okay. we shouldn't hold up finalizing uh, this project simply because there may be around the corner another section that we may want to deal with because well, we can deal with it and it'll be, it'll find its way into the code and-, and So is this something uh, that nothing, we really should decide in, in legal that, that, that it's time to um, you know, vote on what we've accomplished. To, to, to I thought it. that was the direction. Like, yeah, I, like I, I'm not suggesting holding bada it up. Bing, bada I'm mm -hmm. suggesting that let's get get it going yep. and as well as start to review it to see if yep. it makes any sense. Okay. Um, I, I think I think there's one other subtle point um, that we made a, a, about the uh, recodification in that we're changing the process of now including new code promptly rather than waiting at the end of the year to incorporate it as part of the code. Yes. That's, that, that, that's part of what general code should be doing. Correct. Right. It, it, to that point, certainly um, going forward, once it's recodified, we won't have a list of six years worth of right. ordinances you got to go search no. through. They will be incorporated, uh, I think, on a quarterly basis, actually, into the code and searchable and indexed right. and put in the right section. So going forward, it makes it much easier if you want to replace something. So we should move it fast sure. as possible to get this going. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, we discussed, and, and I don't really think that we need to belabor it here because the clerk is um, uh, moving forward and, and is um, and completely in control of our DARM recertification. I think DARM stands for Department of Archives Records Management, is that correct? And this is an, a very important and critical um, certification uh, that it, every municipality uh, uh, is required to have. And um, uh, Susan, uh, uh, our and our clerk, would you like to add anything to that? No. I'm just okay. waiting to hear from the state. I sent the paperwork in, so. Okay. Well, I'm confident that uh, that um, that this process will be completed shortly. Um, 
I'm pleased to say that um, one of the initiatives that we were working on was a policy for the safety of our uh, village hall employees. And I want to say kudos to um, Adam and Barry uh, for uh, this initiative. And uh, Adam, would you like to just share anything about the initiatives and some of the things that you discovered? Yeah, sure. We uh, kind of looked at our emergency plans for our employees, and we've updated our uh, emergency action plan and kind of put that into real life or real world scenarios for our employees to better understand what they need to do in, in a certain types of emergencies. What we also have done, and they're actually taking place on Wednesday and Thursday, uh, we're offering uh, courses in CPR and AED training to our employees. And so we have a good uh, number of employees who are taking advantage of that opportunity. Uh, and then the, the last- participation is good? It's fantastic, oh, it's, it's great. Nice. Um, and then the last thing that we're gonna be doing is opening up some of the CERT training uh, to our employees. And so as, as you know, our community members are, are kind of partaking in that training, we're gonna, the employees are gonna be there as well so that everyone can kind of help out in an emergency. So that was great. Thank you. Um, and uh, the last thing I'm gonna uh, discuss tonight and the rest, um, I don't really want to belabor my time here, is um, um, just to um, talk about the wellness initiative and really not much because <coughs> I would like to just ask the administrator if he has selected the date for us to have our follow-up meeting uh, with I, our yeah, contacts. I'm still waiting from, to hear back from the folks at St. Barnabas. They did, uh, we had met earlier, and mm -hmm. they provided us with a pretty comprehensive package of all the things that they have available, many of which are at no cost to either the employee or the village, and others at nominal cost. Mm -hmm. um, we are currently waiting on some dates back from St. Barnabas to, to have a follow-up meeting to see how we can implement a program. Okay. Um, I, I think we believe it's a, you know, can offer a lot to our employees, which ultimately healthy employees lead to more productive employees, lead to fewer sick days, fewer workers' comp days, um, and ultimately healthier employees, uh, which is obviously good for the employees, but uh, potentially then also bears on our uh, health insurance claims experience and can ultimately lead to lower premiums. And so there's a lot, a lot of positives to come out of it. So we're just waiting on the dates. I will follow up tomorrow to see if we got some dates. Would you? I will I'd appreciate that. that. Thank you. And that concludes my report for tonight. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Levison. Yeah, um, as part of our CAD RMS, uh, Computer Aided Dispatch Records Management System for the Police Department, um, we had a larger, um, or as part of that implementation, <coughs> was to temporarily relocate the dispatch center at the police station into a temporary uh, quarter while we rehab that space so that we could be more effective uh, within uh, the communication dispatch area. Um, and part of the initiative that we now have a uh, architect who's now looking at the building holistically, uh, we, at the last two meetings, focused on uh, that uh, reconfiguration of the police department and how that impacted uh, what we were planning on doing in the reconstruction of the uh, dispatch uh, communications area. And the conclusion is, is that it's not being impacted so today uh, we had our second meeting with the, uh, with the architect and we're now going to move forward um, uh, with the uh, reconfiguration of our dispatch space, which um, spins off a lot of other components which are prerequisites for getting that going. Um, one of them is this consolidation of our closed circuit television systems um, with, and we mentioned it before, Kratos. Uh, Kratos is uh, now given us a proposal. Uh, it's now on the state contract so we can move forward with it. I was hoping to have that as a resolution this evening, but it didn't get onto the agenda because we just got the proposal today. Um, that will How now- do you remember what the total cost on that was? 33,000. Um, but, but that included adding uh, a number of cameras in the police department which don't exist such as cameras that look at our uh, generator uh, that's, uh, that was installed at the police station. Um, in, in addition to um, that relocation, we took a look at uh, the fax machines. We, I think there are five to seven fax machines in the police department, and we're in the process of doing an implementation of electronic fax, and so the fax machines will disappear, hopefully, 
very shortly. Uh, the copiers uh, that we do have installed with, within the various departments have fax capabilities as well. So f uh, once we have had that implemented, faxes that come in go directly to an email uh, that can be observed on uh, the individual's uh, uh, workstations. Uh, that's in the process of being developed. The other is that we've reviewed um, our phone bills, which includes circuits as well as telephone numbers, and we've reduced that bill by about $20,000 a year by wow. eliminating unneeded circuits, which have been sitting around for <laughs> many decades, um, and we've been paying for. Um, in addition, uh, in working with uh, uh, the clerk's office and DARM, we're looking at now taking records management and uh, our archiving and using laser fiche to store documents that are in the police department. So hopefully we can eliminate some of the physical paper that sits around uh, in, in the uh, uh, police department. Uh, in addition, we are continuing on with our radio uh, uh, replacement study. Uh, I think we've come to a conclusion of where we are. There's a grant opportunity uh, with the fire department uh, we want to exercise that grant opportunity, and that grant has to be submitted by December 1st. We're working with our consultant, RCC, to get that grant put together. Uh, we are just need to put the counts of radios uh, required under that uh, uh, new configuration, and we can move forward with that. Um, the, the other uh, pieces that we've implemented as part, part is a, a laser fiche, which is a physical records management system and storage uh, capability. Uh, that in conjunction with another product that we've just implemented called Property Pilot, which uh, now has a linkage between each other so that um, forms, and we're developing that uh, forms with, or maybe Adam would uh, want to describe some of that detail, but we're developing forms under Property Pilot, which um, <coughs> then get linked and saved in our laser fish uh, system. You, you want to maybe describe some of the one that, ones that we've already uh, accomplished? Yeah, uh, currently we're working with a few departments, which is the clerk's office, animal control, uh, code enforcement, and there's one other. But uh, well, what it's basically enabling us to do is, is one of the strategic goals of the village uh, a few years ago, actually a while back, was to create a, a paperless environment and what this is enabling us to do is that residents will be able to go online or to uh, come to the clerk's office and go on to a laptop which will then submit forms that will go right into the uh, main repository to save it as an official document uh, that kind of follows up with what our uh, village clerk uh, Susan is doing with the DARM certification all of this is creating an environment where everything will be shared on a network through property pilot based on location but also creating an environment where everything is digital so. Yeah, and, and one of the other initiatives personally that I have is to introduce e-signature where um, we can use electronic signatures in the various forms that, uh, that we have introduced in, in our system. Um, just one of the other things that we've mentioned is a budget meeting. Um, we had distributed today uh, a discussion about uh, the next meeting being what our next meeting? Uh, no, December. 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 The December eighth um, meeting. I, I would like to see more time dedicated than one hour, uh, as a. Uh, yeah, I I won't be able to make that. Um, but I mean, I have an, another commitment. No, and I and I certainly think um, in advance of that, I'll present you with all the materials, and and that is in no way to suggest that that would necessarily be the one and only meeting, but it, I think it's an initial uh, introduction where we stand, what the key issues, um, as I perceive them, are, you know, challenges, you know, things that we're looking for some direction on, and then um, as needed, certainly we will schedule more and as many workshops as necessary. Yeah, and as well as I invite the CBAC to participate as part of that, uh, that dialogue. <coughs> um, and lastly, we should have our uh, loan uh, or replacement for our ECIA uh, uh, loan in place very shortly. Uh, I just saw the paperwork uh, before we came, came to the meeting tonight. Yeah. 
You want to, you, do you want to talk about, uh, okay. That's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trustee Reiser. Hi, we had a uh, special meeting on Friday morning last week, um, mostly to deal with uh, the recent developments at Mary Warner. We did cover other topics at the, at the Planning and Zoning uh, Committee. But for Mary Lawn, uh, Seton Hall withdrew their application uh, for plans at the uh, project, and we've talked about uh, setting up a committee to study the uh, potential zoning or reuse of that property. And uh, so we wanted, would like to set up a subcommittee with the Planning and Zoning Committee that will include a member of the Montrose Park Historic District, West Montrose, someone from uh, the Village Attorney's Office, the Village Planner, and a couple other people. Development um, committee. Excuse me? And development committee. The, envi the environmental commission? No. Development, development. development. development committee. Oh, the development committee. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we, and uh, we've reached out to a couple people to, who will, and we're going to have our first official meeting uh, next Friday. Um, there'll be a subcommittee of the planning and zoning committee and will be advertised so all three trustees and I guess anyone else can come as well. Um, but there, there, were, there were definitely concerns about that property uh, from not only from the neighborhood, but also from the village of what's going to happen. That's about five acres of property at the, uh, at the uh, northern entrance to the town off of Scotland Road. And we feel that it needs to, to really be looked at and considered and see what the neighbor, what the residents want and what the board wants and how we move forward. Um, <clears throat> With that, we also had a uh, brief update on Orange Lawn, which uh, they've already made public, so I, I don't have to hold it back anymore, but they had a meeting with the residents. They're, they're considering selling, uh, <coughs> selling off attractive property at the, uh, uh, there to, to put development there because the club is having some financial difficulties and they want to uh, move forward. So we're also going to look at that, about the zoning and the, uh, of that property and other issues we discussed were lawn signs, uh, specifically uh, lawn signs that are put on village property in the downtown and village property that's on the so-called village greenways, the little grassy area between the sidewalk and the curb, where, where lawn signs are prohibited. And we're specifically uh, dealing with a lot of lawn signs in the downtown, besides, besides the election signs. Uh, I think it was college hunks with junk, which littered the... Uh, the South Orange Avenue and some other neighborhoods. So we. Wait, what was that? <laughs> college hunks with junk, moving junk, whatever they call themselves. You got the phone number? Yeah. <laughs> 1 800 column. So, uh, we, uh, there was a Hickson. So we, we agreed to. Uh, so we agreed that we were going to go around and they removed all the signs that day, actually, uh, from the town. But we, we want to make sure that that stayed in force because it's nothing more than littering. When they, when they continue to do it. We ask people to keep, if they want to put a lawn sign up, to keep it on their property. Um, the RFP for the master plan was supposed to go out last week. I'm not sure if it did, um, but it was supposed to go out. And if it didn't go out last week, Barry, make sure it goes uh, out this no, week. It will be, um, should go out this week. Uh, Sorry, should go out this week. Um, it's getting finalized in uh, the purchasing agent had, she did give me back some comments. She was right. gone part of last week, and in, in the intervening period, she reviewed it, and we'll get it finalized. Um, Sheena already mentioned about COA and the SOTAC. Um, I think that was the major issues. Um, that's it for tonight. The regular Planning Zone Committee meets next Tuesday night. We're meeting with the HPC. Uh, to go over uh, their concerns about the master plan. Is it next Tuesday or tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, okay. tomorrow. Did I, did I miss any up? Do you have any information or did I miss it about Mary Lawn? What do you mean information? We have a subcommittee looking at okay. zoning changes. Okay, thanks. For us to schnall. Okay, um, so at um, our monthly cultural arts and recreation meeting, um, the current exhibit, as uh, Village President Torpy had mentioned, is Tableau, and that is in cooperation with Seton Hall students, 
And next month in December, it will be the Book Arts Roundtable. And that will be, both of those are in the Piero Gallery. Uh, coming up November 29th is the Giants of Jazz. It's always a big annual event. And this year we'll be honoring McCoy Tyner. On the recreation side, the uh, programs for the winter sports uh, programs, which uh, will be beginning November 1st, they include basketball, indoor soccer, girls indoor lacrosse, taekwondo, and fitness programs. Uh, something that came up as a discussion, some of the programming is somewhat limited just due to our shortage of gym space. So uh, our department head has indicated that uh, that's one of the great limitations we have uh, in our community in terms of the recreational opportunities has to do with our limited amount of, of gym space. We do avail ourselves um, and work with the Board of Education. They do make some of the schools uh, gyms available, but that would be something that we have been looking <coughs> Um, to the future to, to find out if there might be additional facilities for, for, for future programs. Uh, also on that side, just uh, uh, news of a renewal. Uh, hopefully folks have been relatively happy with the pool concession, the food items that, and grill that was available. We have renewed Michael Mealy's um, concession, so that will be going on towards next year. Uh, moving on to <coughs> subcommittees. Um, as I think was mentioned earlier by Trustee Collum, um, the uh, holiday events, it's amazing, we're in, we're in November, but uh, yes. the holidays are right around the corner. So the weekend of the 12th and 13th and 14th, the 12th will be a, um, the Irvington Avenue area will be having an event there in the evening. The 13th will be the, the village uh, sponsored by the Village Center Alliance, their hometown holiday schedule. The, there may even be an appearance of uh, Mr. Santa Claus, as well as a tree lighting on the 13th. So that's something to look forward to that weekend. And I believe SOPAC is also hosting uh, a holiday-based event. With regards to the Historic Preservation Com uh, Commission, I want to thank uh, several members who came out to Village Hall, even though we uh, have basically taken out most of the items that we felt were uh, were in the in the village hall. There was a safe uh, that was still had quite a bit of materials in it. And thank you to Amy Don from the commission, as well as Alan Delosier from Seton Hall, Melissa Kopecki, and Kadita from the South Orange Public Library, um, because back then they did not have DARM. There was not. Uh, any digital uh, record keeping and so there is plenty of paper and some really interesting documents that we found that dated back uh, literally almost, uh, actually somewhere a hundred years ago there was a, uh, a newspaper uh, clipping from back then a, uh, a presidential ballot for FDR's first of four terms uh, where he was running against uh, Wilkie Mark uh, you voted in that right? I think <laughs> 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 One for Alex. Thank you, Ryan. Alex knows there's always a payback. I knew, I'm ready. He gets off his tricycle. Let's go. Wait for it. But again, thanks to those. And, and um, uh, actually, the clerk uh, will, will be going back in because there are uh, additional materials there. Uh, and it's, it's really, it's, it's an amazing thing to go back in history to see these, these documents and uh, uh, zoning plans, maps, uh, dated back uh, such a long time ago. It's really fascinating. Uh, and then lastly, just a, 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 I want to share a personal experience. I was here this past week here in SOPAC, where we're being currently hosted, uh, for two sold-out performances. And they were, actu they were absolutely extraordinary. Arlo Guthrie, um, who is just, you know, uh, uh, the folk singer from, you know, he's Woody's son, but uh, he's taken a him and Pete Seeger have made such a difference. So, th so that was a great show on Tuesday. And then David Bromberg uh, was uh, here on Saturday night also to a sold out crowd, which was really terrific. From a, from a more um, operational question, um, there's something, a discussion we're having, and I'm, I'm curious uh, if folks here uh, have any strong feelings about this. Um, some nonprofits put on a sort of a junior board member position. So it's not the full responsibility of a trustee or a governor or commission, but they bring in younger folks uh, who can come in and they don't, again, they don't have the same responsibilities, but they might be tasked with doing some fundraising and some operational stuff. Uh, and so SOPEC is looking in. So if you think you, if, if you're aware of folks in our community, maybe in their 20s or 30s, uh, who would like to get some exposure to, to being involved 
Uh, and I can't think of a better place than to be in this facility. You know, it's sort of a fun thing for young people to get involved with. Um, so we're currently considering having a junior board for, for SOPAC. So anybody who knows anybody, uh, let myself or uh, Executive Director Mark Packer know. And I think I will end it with that. Is there a rough age cutoff that you're looking in terms of junior? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would say Two 20s and eligible. 30s. You're, you're, you're eligible there, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> You want to say okay. it? No, 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 no. <laughs> I've had my fun. But um, <laughs> and do you really, do, is there some type of cutoff? I would say 20s and 30s. Yes. Yeah, so, so again, the idea is, is for, for folks, um, it's a great opportunity to, to get involved on boards. Several corporations, by the way, are promoting community service more and more as a part of, not a condition of employment, but encouragement for management uh, and moving up is to get on boards to do community service. Um, and so this would be a great way for folks in their 20s or 30s to, 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 to step in in this type of a role. Uh, it usually does include some sort of fundraising, whether it's writing your own personal check or bringing in monies from people you know. Uh, again, it wouldn't be at the same level that a full board member would be expected, but it's a great way to get started. Great. Um, and I just would like you to just to change the tone and that of sadness just to mm. uh, mention you know, about uh, our loss. Yes, I mean, the, uh, our, unfortunately, our the, loss. the department heads, uh, Kate Schmidt's uh, husband, um, passed away at a much too young age um, this past week. Uh, our sympathies and, and empathies go to, to Kate and her family uh, in the sadness of, of his passing. Okay. Thank you. Um, mm. Is there... Uh, let's see. Um, is there anybody, uh, any member of the public who wishes to speak at this time? Okay. Um, if there's no other <coughs> items, questions, anything, I'd ask for a motion to adjourn. I move. Moved by Trustee Levison, seconded Second. by Trustee Column. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.